that's the classroom. Like you bring, your, bring your curriculum. It is. Bring your lesson plan. Yeah. But also be prepared for it to to not be necessary. Andy McClure is a an art educator in Ontario, Canada, and I'm pretty stoked to be able to say that he is a very good friend of mine. I'll never forget way back in the day when Andy and I were working together and we were both at a leadership meeting. We were sitting on opposite sides of the table and I can remember we were discussing basically the courses that would run the next year. So uh, the leadership group that I was a part of, it was part of our mandate to kind of talk about the courses uh, in as neutral a manner as possible and in as a whole school view as possible, which can be really difficult if one of the courses that are being discussed and one of the courses that could potentially be chopped was one of your loves. And it was in that moment where, you know, we're listening to these different courses, almost almost the, the different members around this group were having to pitch as to why to keep these courses, that Andy turned a corner with the conversation and, you know, he put put to the table what sort of a school and what sort of a school culture are we building towards? What is it that we want to be able to say that we love about our school? And, you know, from across the table, it completely swept me out of my mindset of almost like protecting, protecting courses that I loved. And it instantly put me in this kind of relational mode where I had to consider the whole school's interest. And in doing so, it kind of changed it changed what I wanted to negotiate for. And to be honest, at that point, I wasn't sure what I was going to negotiate for because I hadn't considered I hadn't considered it from that point of view. Annie McClure is a, a gem, a, a true artist, I guess you could say, when it comes to his involvement in education and his interest in sharing the things that he learns goes far deeper than what comes out in the classroom. What comes out in the classroom is awesome. But as I started off this statement, I said I'm an honored to be able to call him a friend. And the conversation that I had with him, I know I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember this conversation for a long time. The Chasing Scrolls podcast is an exploration of how education and the education system has changed and the impact impact that those changes have had to both educators inside and slightly outside the box. I know that Andy works inside of the box. Like I said, he's an art teacher, but I've always felt that his creativity and his dignity and elegance in the way that he carries that classroom really speaks to some of the most necessary parts of education and I hope you enjoy the conversation Um, man as much as I did Andy how's it going it's excellent Andy I gotta tell you that you when I think back on my 11 years working with you you gonna and make I, me cry. I, I'm, and I'm okay with that. And that's, you know, before I started recording, I think that is a real risk <laughs> in sort of uh, talking about the richness of actually talking to someone face to face. And I'll say right now, what's uh, this is a very different podcast for me because um, my first few episodes to all my three listeners out there, what's different. I, I've overused that joke already. Um, but uh, what's different with this one is that I'm recording face to face. So this is this is a different tact. So I know for sure that part of our conversation is going to be it's going to be stamped with that. Because, you know, getting you as natural as an artificially created moment to have a conversation. Yes. <laughs> um I'm hoping that, uh, yeah, I'm hoping that if we cry, we cry. Hey, 
will be for all the world to listen to, right? They have to decide if they fast forward or it's isn't just... That, isn't that why we brought the onions? Yeah, that's the onions, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so my, my initial, my lead is that I definitely, I need to tell you that now not working with you, I do miss a lot of the conversations. Every, I can, I can actually say every, I, I reminisce and I think about the power of every single one of our conversations that somehow started with an educator's frame and ended in a completely different place. And that, the essence of that for me is, is like, it is that, 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 it is that sort of analogy that someone could, you know, they Google it and they find out, you know, the spirit, what, what kids will remember is, is not the curriculum. Yeah. And I don't, I can't tell you topically the ground that we covered, but I will tell you flat out when I think of, um, like you're my, you're, you're my, my spirit animal. <laughs> and I know that's <laughs> nice. That's good. <laughs> yeah. But so the lead on this beyond the, the throwing compliments and I'll do as many as I can along the way. When I think of you and I think of your, you as an educator, I do remember that often we found ourselves talking what felt like the spirit of teaching. It felt like, it felt like we were, um, examining the soul of teaching. And of course we can make, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to explore what that means, what gets extended to the students. But I think first I want to, I want to kind of stick why, why that's important for teachers, educators to be in touch with that. And I'm, I'm, I'm so curious, like, are you, are you mindful of how you bring that to your spaces? Like, are, are you aware that you have that, that effect? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I would say that uh, um, early on in my life, I decided that um, I was looking for something. Hmm. And, um, and that something was always uh, just beyond my comprehension. But it was tantalizingly present all the time. And... Uh, whatever I was doing at school or even in relationships, there was always like that, that sense that, that they held, the moment held something that I needed to, to understand a bigger picture. Um, and, I, and I guess what I hopefully bring then to my classroom is that, is, is that I wanna put down the breadcrumbs of that same quest that you know the need to sort of know or understand or to experience or to follow or to um, be in the pursuit of something uh, I think my um, my best teachers were the teachers who were passionate about something, um, and when their conversations in the classroom went sideways, it always came back to the thing that they were passionate about. And sometimes it was the subject matter, but sometimes it wasn't. And their voice changed, and the tenor of the classroom changed. And we went silent because we knew at that moment that what was being said was important. Um, and because there's a difference between <laughs> hearing things that you need to know and then hearing things that are important in terms of your being mm -hmm. to, you know, to fuel your fire and Often those things are, you know, stamp collecting or rock collecting or stars at night or sound of wind or playing music or writing poems or things that are not necessarily what, you know, your neighbor is following. But there's something in it that... that leads you to the next question, that leads you to the next 
opening. Um, I think in terms of my own life, um, having grown up in a house that um, I had an artist father and an artist mother and a dad who was a photographer who took pictures of things because he was always looking for the next thing and a mother who went around painting things because she was always looking for the next thing. Mm -hmm. I sort of grew up in a, in a place where that was always nourished. Um, but at the same time, both of them struggled with happiness. Mm -hmm. Both of them struggled with being together. And mm -hmm. my brother and sister both struggled with happiness and finding themselves. And I think um, that that place in my life, in my family, in my inner circle, I was always, always responsible for helping to put pieces back together for them, to help them sort of, you know, get back on track again. Mm -hmm. And um, and the you know, it, it, I think it's it's taken most of my life to come to understand that that process is a. Um, um, is a dance. I've used that word before too. Yeah, because you, you, the moment you start to think that you're the teacher or you're the facilitator or that you're the the one that's brought the lesson, you miss the opportunity. Um, and I, I think you know, my early life provided an opportunity for me to learn a lot. Um, and I think that's what happens now in my classroom, I go in with that same, I, I, I want to know these people and I want to know this place, I want to know this space because if I'm paying attention, if I'm really listening, then these moments are going to present themselves for both of us or all of us to have this dance where we both are <laughs> Um, sparked into something that neither of us could have understood before that moment it happens. And that, you know, and I know musicians who play together and that moment of improv music where neither musician feels like they're the one creating the improv that's occurring and that somehow the music that occurs in that moment is bigger than both of them, or, or or the group. That's always been my what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully, um, I think most of my students understand after a while of being with me that you know the curriculum is just the it's just the thing in the middle that helps us to come back when we need to ground ourselves but it's not the thing that we're after um i want i gotta write it down because i want to come back to curriculum in the middle yeah. and challenge you a yeah. little bit on that um first though i wanted when my first question to you was you had mentioned breadcrumbs so my yeah. first my lead on that is like i like that breadcrumbs sort of that that lead that sort of path there's something about breadcrumbs that note though is that there's the risk that they're going to be picked up by something other than you, who you're intendedly <laughs> leaving that path for right and yes. i think there's enough uh fables and and, and nursery <laughs> yes. rhymes that talk about the dangers of going into places <laughs> yes and your breadcrumbs are gone um i now i started that but i think that got too dark i didn't know i was like no oh, this gets real scary so to keep it maybe lighter is who do you feel sets breadcrumbs for you? Mm. So when, and, and maybe one way to look at, one way to sort of come at this could be, you know, who would be your men mentor list or just your inspired or list? Like, who do you feel is setting like these kind of, you're great at setting context for that. It, it, what you are saying right now, your hope for the dance, you're setting the, I've seen it. I've existed in it. I can never replicate it but I've enjoyed it. I can try to do some of the things, but I fail at it. But you create a context that makes people willing to take that chance. 
and I've spoken with your students, we've cross-taught students, and they have shared with me the that spectrum of response from what the blank is going on all the way to I have to go back and talk to Mr. <laughs> McClure. And I think that's a, no matter what, that's a compliment because that that's impact yeah. and that's connection. And like you said, that's that moment of a re reveal that not forced but happens and informs both of you. Yeah. Who sets breadcrumbs for you? Um, well, uh, I'm obviously mom and dad were, you know, initial having pursued a life of creativity. Mm -hmm. um, I had really simple grandparents, you know, um, sort of not a lot of money. And, you know, my grandfather was a carpenter and my never knew my uh, mom's um, dad. But my grandmother was, uh, you know, a clerk in an office in Scotland and um, was just this most loving and giving and simple woman you could meet. Um, she was my hero growing up. There's a real sense that there was um, a purity to her life, hmm. a simplicity to it. Um, that, you know, she was the one who would save her pennies after she would um, make a purchase and she would put them in a jar. And so when you came to visit, there would be a jar of coins there that she could she could give to you um would she would she actually she would yeah give you, yeah okay. yeah she would give you the coins right? it she wasn't was, just the promise it was the no she, take it. she was one of those people that if you'd asked for her to do something mm -hmm. if you'd asked her to walk two kilometers mm -hmm. to go to a picnic in a park um she would do it mm -hmm. um which is why you, you as a child you learn to be careful with those people because mm -hmm. because they're such gifts and they're fragile and you know you can't ask for more than you know <laughs> you're willing <laughs> to give there mm -hmm. um, when I growing up I you know reading books um, you know you were talking about podcasts and Alan Watts podcast mm -hmm. I remember pulling down a book off my dad's shelf, and it was Oriental Metaphysics and the Christian Religion, mm -hmm. Alan Watts. And it was way over my head. And I, I remember reading it just going, like, oh, I want to know. I want to know more, you know. Um, Joseph Campbell. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, hearing the story of Joseph Campbell going out and, you know, spending sort of five years of just reading reading books and he would read a book and, and there would all be all these questions that the book would bring up. These authors that he'd never read or ideas that he'd never heard of. And then he would make a list and then go purchase those books and, and read those topics. Um, and I, I think having had, my mom was uh, pursuing um, religion when I was young. And so we tried out a lot of different churches Quaker churches and Anglican churches and Protestant variations and and um, what I loved about Campbell and Watts was this, there was this, this like um, stringing together of these complex ideas and patterns and finding sort of new ways to express them and and think about them and talk about them. Um, uh, and that idea of sort of like weaving together patterns of, of finding this sort of web of things and connecting them, that, that any time I find somebody that's sort of like in the pursuit of that, in whatever subject area, that's, you know, I always think of like their sort of, <laughs> their breadcrumb mm -hmm. people, right? Who yeah. are sort of like, you know, this is the path I'm on and, and you might want to follow this and I don't know where it's going, but it, it but there's, there's stuff there. Um, um, being involved in, in the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. So my own pursuit of ideas uh, led to one of my students saying, you have to meet my brother, who's this crazy guy who's um, gone off to live in Japan and study martial arts. And um, he's married a dancer and 
Um, he's come back to Winnipeg and opened up a martial arts school, and and um, every weekend he goes out to the reserve and spends time at sweat and ceremony. Mm -hmm. And um, a year after she graduated, she phoned me and said, uh, my brother's in, coming into town and uh, we're having a sweat lodge and I thought I should call you and let you know that, you know, that you might want to come. And, um, and that was a path. As a kid, I remember opening up one of my dad's history books because he was you know, really interested in history. Um, and his library, in a little library, you know, he'd smoke his pipe and type on a typewriter. And, uh, and um, was, there was a sanctum of learning there. And he had all these history books. And I remember opening up one of the history books about Canadian uh, indigenous culture and looking through it and, and being maybe age six or seven and knowing even then, like I wanted to know more about that culture. I wanted to know what those people were doing, what they were thinking, what they were feeling, what, what you know, what was the sound, what was the taste, what was the, the, the texture of, the, of these paintings? Because uh, most of them were paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, going to sweat the first time and meeting an elder, um, I probably have spent 10, 15 years finding elders um, and learning about what that means, mm -hmm. um, what elder means. It, it's because it's, it's, it's not an occupation. It's not something you um, apply for or sign up for. It's just um, a byproduct of the experience of your life. Um, produces the opportunity for people to uh, seek your help, support, mm -hmm. guidance. And if enough people show up at your door and are asking, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then you become an elder um, uh, by your agreement to answer the door. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the interesting thing about that is, is that, that their lives are usually so complex and so interesting and so non-linear mm -hmm. um, that there's no sort of, there's no clear pattern that you can say that, you know, that exists. It's just, they all have a same, uh, there's a difference between um, sacred and profane moments for them. And there's a moment when they're just laughing and having coffee and and sitting. And then a moment when ceremony is is on. And I've seen that with, you know, with an elder before a ceremony, <clears throat> just sitting around in a you know, on a lawn chair, having a cigarette and a cup of coffee with a group of people, and somebody sit down beside them and say something. And that moment becomes ceremonial. Everything shifts. And the elder, you know, talks to them or listens to them or um, gets them a coffee. Mm -hmm. But that even the getting of the coffee is transformational. Hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I think that... Um, that breadcrumb path, that those people in my life um, that I sort of, you know, are, are looking for, are those people that um, seem to be able to help create transformational moments occur. You know, I think, you know, just in terms of our connection and our relationship, I mean, um, you, you are more than empathetic and more than compassionate. You're more than mm, thank you. You, you do more than care. Um, but I think part of our part of our common language is actually, uh, though I, I don't speak it, is the kitchen. Mm. Um, 
where these transformational moments occur and where you have learned that if you pay attention to the ingredients and you pay attention to how you stir, how you stand, cook, how you turn on the oven, how you how the window is, how the light in the kitchen is, <laughs> how the <laughs> like the that space. If you pay attention to that space, then what occurs is more than cooking. Mm-hmm. Um, but you literally get to see transformation. You literally get to see things rise and shape and change texture and color and form and, and all of that. But you also get to see that, that, that consumption mm-hmm. and what that does then to the person who's consuming it and the space that is, you know, shared. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as an artist, there is um, the making of the work and then there is the sharing of the work. And the making of the work is always um, the bringing together of the ingredients mm-hmm. and of creating patterns <laughs> that you have found from some other people that you've shared with other people. You know, I introduced you to Preeti and, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, I wanted Preeti just to meet you, even though, you know, you didn't share much. And I wanted Preeti just to say something about wanting to learn from her mom cooking mm. because, because that there's so much more in that. <laughs> There, oh yeah, <laughs> there's the you know it, it, the moment you begin to look at that you go oh there's there's family relationship and there's mm-hmm. cultural history and there's what goes on every day in the house and in, in, in the table and you know there, there's this um, um, dynamic mm-hmm. that's that's made up of these layers of complex patterns. Um, I think when I moved from science to art in terms of my education, what I found was meaningful for me was that um, science seemed to me in terms of the way I had always been taught it or the way I had just been processing it as... um, linear processes and and when I discovered art or at least in the way in which it was again presented to me the processes were relational not linear so walking in the hall with you Mm -hmm. um, I asked about your hip Mm -hmm. well actually I asked about your walking Mm -hmm. Um, because I was listening to your hip Mm. but also because your hip wanted to be listened to and so it wanted me to ask that question and answering asking the question just like this invites a conversation Mm -hmm. which opens up a possible set of new dynamics Mm -hmm. it's um Back a bit, you were mentioning that kind of sitting down with the elder and getting getting the attention of the elder. And it strikes me that in the moment that you're asking, the answer, if the elders really work in it, is that you are already being paid attention to. And what the elder asks in that moment is not for you to pay attention to the elder, but to pay more attention to self. You're okay. You're yeah. in, you're in the present self, yes. right? And uh, it made me. I mean, you had a whole bunch of things pinging off in my brain as you were as you were talking. But one of the things that that came to me in in as you were describing the presence of the elder, what connections. What connections do you see between 
elder and educator? Are they connected? Are they intentionally distanced at some points? And when are they necessarily, they have to be brought back together? What are your, your thoughts on that? Well, I've seen elders um, refuse to work with um, people that have come to ask for support. Wow. Um, there was um, a woman in Japan, Ms. Sensei Osumi, mm-hmm. and um, she did a practice called Sekijitsu. And um, one of the things that she used to say to people who came to see her is that if she, if she wouldn't work with them, she'd ask them to go work in the garden. Mm-hmm. Um, Apprenticeship. Yes, yeah. And so they would come with some serious issues, serious problems. And some of them were, um, you know, quite wealthy. One of her clients was the um, head of Sony. And I, he was one of the guys that invented the uh, VCR. Hmm. And, you know, they, they would expect to be listened to and to be taught. And um, she would say um, that they had to have soft hearts before that she could work with them. Yep. And I think sometimes, you know, the elder's role is to... Um, uh, to help the student be ready to, you know, receive. There's I a think. rigor there. There's a rigor there. There's a rigor to being human. Yes. <laughs> there is. Yeah. And, and then it works both ways because it reminds the, the, you that you're, you know, you, they also have to be ready to teach you, you know, or to mm-hmm. receive you. Um, and maybe that is also time for them to sort of find their own, space, you know, for that moment, because it, it's not something that can be demanded. It's not something that can be, you know. So I, I, the interesting thing about um, seeing this process at work, um, uh, my friend, the martial artist, eventually became a doctor, mm. and he's a um, uh, very good family counselor. And um, so he does emergency medicine, and he, and he also does counseling. And mm-hmm. um, there, there are two different sort of processes at work there. And during, you know, um, triage and emerge, there's a practicality to his training. Mm-hmm. Here's what needs to be done, and here's how it needs to be done. And, and there is a creativity in a in a, in triage to be able to go. Here's what I think might need to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, here's what I'm preempting before things become cascade. And in in counseling, there is a um, there's here's what needs to be done, but the path to, to to be there to get there also requires some creativity and some um, risk. Um, on both parts, and I think that's why he's very good at what he does. Um, one of my teachers was a guy named Bradford Keeney, and he's a uh, you know brilliant jazz um, uh, player, uh, you know, a bit of a scientist, and wrote a bunch of books on um, resource-based therapy for um, psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. And um, what made him such a great psychotherapist was his jazz playing. Mm-hmm. Um, the ability to be able to um, to wait in a moment for the moment to present itself. The beat. The beat. The beat. Yeah. Um, and to understand, and this is this is what I think is the most brilliant part of all of this. Is it's what I found to be the most brilliant part of my art education and my my teaching, is that I will make mistakes all the time. But 
the creative process won't. Mm. Um, that's the elder. That's the elder. That's the elder in that's your elder. in your in your. That's the elder in your operating system. Yeah, I like the, that. The, the elder can say, um, "Here's what I would like you to do," and and take a risk. Notice uh, yourself. Yeah, notice yourself. <laughs> and the if the if everyone's being honest in the process, everyone's committed to the process, everyone's falling into the process. The moment they've fallen in, the process itself will generate the transformative moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to call it the transformative moment, the learning. You know, I really I love that idea now that learning is the brain actually changing. Learning is when we're not the same afterwards that something has occurred within us that is different um, and you know that's you know from a neural network perspective or a cellular perspective or a, or a, you know I don't know some cognitive pattern system but th th there's something different and generating those transform transform transformative um, situations um, becomes easier now because I assume less responsibility for trying to create them. Student, notice yourself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That is the mindful movement that we're in right now. Yeah. You're well placed in your in your approach. <laughs> it's like education. You finally caught up to me. <laughs> yes. No, seriously. That's just occurring to me now. As we sit here and you're sort of unwinding this and I'm listening to you and I'm having board initiatives ping off in my head. I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the decentralizing of teacher as leader, teacher as facilitator, co-learner, all the co's, and the, the wellness initiatives that are so mm. centrally connected with seeing self understanding self, unwinding, unpacking self and saying, I can do this. Like I'm, I, I can, I can learn when you were talking about the, the process honesty. I love that in the process, it's the sustenance. It's like you, you depend on it. Right. And one of the sort of catchy phrases right now, one of the newfangled digital phrases of modern learning is learn. I think I'm getting it right. It's something like learn, unlearn, relearn, repeat. Yeah. And I just wrote down, that's not new. What you're suggesting is that it's not you. Yeah. And the cycle that we're on, I don't know if it's been more obvious about what we need to do. It doesn't actually, in so much as it seems um, exploratory, it's not experimental. We now have the science that says this type of spirituality, this type of um, looking inward is good for us. It's very good for us. And it's good for other people too. Yeah. I, I, I... I think in that, like, you know, go back to Alan Watson, that, like, the, what was really interesting about that old 60s, 70s, you know, time period and looking at an at, at Eastern perspective, you know, the idea that, you know, if you want to know something, you want it to come to some sort of brilliance, you know, you'd show up at the, at the temple and they'd hand you the mop. Yeah. And they'd say, go mop the floors. Yeah. And, and then usually the student would say, yeah, but I came here to learn something. You know, I want to speak with a teacher. Mm -hmm. I want to be taught. And they would say, go, you know, go take the mop. And um, I'm, I'm actually, I remember taking students to Japan. Mm -hmm. And we went to a, a, a Buddhist temple in Tokyo. And it was early morning and the fog was out and it was quite beautiful. And the bus stopped and the kids wanted to get into the temple because the, there was this light rain falling and they wanted to get a photo Shelter. of the monks. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they wanted to see the monks because the bus, the tour guide had said, yeah, the, the monks will be out, you know, because we're really early. It almost sounded frame as if like you're going to a zoo. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Got to get my, my picture. The kids jump off the bus and they, you know, they go up the thing and they're going to the front of the temple or whatever. And one of the girls was was getting off, and she was sort of fussing with her camera and her film. And and um, I said to her, like, "Do you see the monks?" And um, she's like, "No, no." And I, I said, "Do you see the gardeners?" And there was all these people on the front lawn with bamboo 
freezers, yep. picking up pine needles and putting them into wicker baskets. And I said, okay, those, those, the gardeners, those are the monks. They're in class right now. That, that's what they're doing. They're studying. Right? That, that's the process by which they come to great understanding is actually by collapsing our, our organizational patterns. Yeah. It's like I have to name something and then I have to put it into a context with five other things and then mm -hmm. that creates a new name and, and then I define it and I put it in a box with a set of relational constructs around it until I have constructed this massive knowing of the world. And, of course, one other possibility was to strip out all of those constructs mm -hmm. and to say that your knowing of the world might be relational, like that you develop a great sense of having, knowing how to relate to something. And therefore, then, when your experience occurs, you're always experiencing it, you're always understanding things in the moment that you're having it. You know, you, you, you have the moment and you have with it the understanding that this is only the moment in which you are understanding it. And it, it, and it, it's by the, you know, it acknowledges the temperature of the room that you're in in the moment you had the experience because that's it. As opposed to sort of going from the outside, which we do, we do in our classes. We, we, we keep piling on more and more ideas you know, all the way through to, to you get somewhere in university where you suddenly start shrinking the ideas down into a narrower and narrower focus to you get to this, you know, you're very, very good at understanding some small part. Mm -hmm. I think there's, I, I like, I like the elegance of the monotasking too. There's a real elegance to that. You, in that, if you could, if you could be the monk, for a moment, there's something singular and centering to picking up something so small that you're crippling yourself. It's like you have to be there. And I think that is sort of wrapped in the understanding that what you're doing is also purposeful. Yeah. Whether you're on your one of 100,000 and you're just counting it and you know you have to have 100,000 in your satchel or you're aware of the geography as in I have to clear this space that I'm in. And when my colleague meets me at that space, then that is when the task is done. If I happen to get to 200,000 and I meet partway into what I perceive to be their space, the job is still done. Yes. And that, that it's hyper-realistic. No, actually, sorry, it's realistic. It's not hyper real. It is realistic. And I like the, I love the imagery. I love, and it's so you to ask that question, do you see? Do you notice? Because it's, it's, it's not a, it's not I'm going to give it to you for free. It's a, it's just, it's just a little sort of like, it's, it's the change in the ether. It's the ephemeral sort of moment. You pay notice to this moment. And I've been in similar moments. If we go back to the kitchen where... I've instructed the students as to what it means to boil water. <laughs> yeah. But I've also told a story about noticing the moment before the water boils. And you wait to see which set of instructions becomes their operating system. And there's a real beauty in that. And if that is part of what you and I share, and I would feel privileged to sort of share that moment, that really is the sweet spot for me when I teach, is that... I will tell the story. I, I am comfortable with whatever meager understanding I have of existing in elder and educator space because a large part of my teaching is stories. I got the curriculum. I learned it too. And yes. I can go there if I have to. I don't naturally go there. But I like that. I like that I can have a student, someone who I know has learned from me, because they come back and share their learning through one of my stories and how, what they stole from it. I gave it. I say stole. I, yeah. Sometimes I say that because it just yeah, yeah. makes it a little bit more sort of energized. But really, you give away freely. There's no stealing. I 
try and practice that in my teaching every day. If I create, it's because that's what I'm compelled to. And because I'm compelled to do it, take it. I'm going to create again. I'm not saying take my coffee. That might be the only one I can get that day. But really, yes. <laughs> yes. if I am creating, then I am existing as a teacher. And I try and share that, as do you. As do you. That is a thing that I think is so wholeheartedly in your soul as a teacher that someone accused me of being a creative, being a creative person. And I thought to myself, that's a very nice compliment. But I got a little bit sad for them too, because I felt like in the compliment, they were saying something less about themselves. Yeah. And all I said, I said, I, I flipped from that. I said, um, let's, let, do you want to draw something? I started drawing something and I said, what would you add to it? Like we were, so it was actually, it was part of something we had to create, but I had to, I knew I had to flip quickly from being accused of something that they didn't have. I wasn't comfortable with that. Yeah. I wanted them to sort of have an experience that would somehow counter, just like those kids. I made the assumption that they were going there just to steal the picture. Now that might've been partially true. I mentioned being in the zoo. Do you notice the monks? <laughs> yes. I love how you managed to create a context for them that it wasn't just about capturing the picture. It was about understanding what they were capturing and maybe even making the choice. Do I really need to take a picture yeah. or is this the picture I want to take? Yeah. All my photos from that trip and I took some beautiful photos from that trip. Um, a student had borrowed my camera before I went mm -hmm. and had broken the mirror and mm -hmm. never told me that the mirror was broken. So mm -hmm. none of my photos from that trip ever worked. I will tell you, I actually haven't tested the audio on this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this could be our SLR moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope not. Please be recording. Okay, yeah. keep going. You know, and I remember that as being part of the experience of the trip of coming back and going, okay, so I have no photos. But I have these, I have these moments, I have these memories. Like I have a memory of a student taking a photo of the roots of a tree um, uh, along, the, uh, along one of our walks. And, and I knew what she was taking a photo of. She was taking a photo of, of, of a poetic moment, right? You know, and, I, and what excited me about that was that I knew that that's what she was looking at. I knew that that's what she was seeing. She wasn't seeing roots. She was seeing exposed structure. She was being, seeing a, a space where what should be underground is above, where the, the unconscious and the conscious are intermingling, and, and, and there's a sensuality. One of my students today said in class, um, she came up and danced around for a while and said, you know, basically, um, I don't know if I can take any more art courses because I've got to take all these science courses and I don't, can't fit it in. And I, I said, it's okay if you don't take any more art courses. I just don't want you to ever not be an artist. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I said, I hope... Or to think that it's a trade-off. Yeah, and I said, I hope you understand that it's, a that it's yeah. not like making things, making objects is just a small part of being an artist. Being an artist is being a creative, imaginative, interesting person who understands that, um, that there is a, um, a way to thinking and experiencing the world that is, that fuels, you know, that, um, mind. And, you know, if you're taking biology, please be an artist in your biology class. Not doodling during the class, although that's okay too, but like recognize that, 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 you know, one of the kids today in photography asked about why do we have the rule of thirds in composition? And I mm -hmm. said, it's about balance. And I turned her hand over and I said, how many segments do you have on your finger? She counted out three. And I said, you know, why does, why, why isn't this segment longer than the other segments? Why is it? Why is this finger not longer than the other finger? And of course, it, it, it comes down to our DNA, but it comes down to balance and it mm -hmm. comes down to dynamics. And, it, and when you start to understand that your, um, you think it stopped? No, I think we're still good. Okay. Um, that, uh, that the physical hand is an embodiment of 
all of the things that we've been trying to learn in photography class mm -hmm. because that's the way in which the unraveling of cells and DNA have created you. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty that's a pretty profound thing. And I think what that then leads to, I hope what it leads to is, and I think what I've found in like my friend Bill, who's the doctor, or Brad, is a sense of awe that, that, and God, if I could do anything in my class, if I could, if I could have a sort of an, an outcome that I would be like, ah, oh, you know, if, if, if I had created in any moments a sense of awe that, that the sum of the parts of the things that they're examining are bigger than their understanding or that what their brain can box up and answer in a test, that, that they stand in some moment in front of mystery and that they're participating in it, hmm. not unraveling it yeah, or yeah, yeah. decoding it or deciphering it, but that mystery, uncertainty is their is the breadcrumb is is the is the the thing that leads us you know to want to know more to experience more to feel more to experience more, um, and that 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 mystery is actually the in, you know, is the ingredient that's like, that brings out all that's the flavor of our life right yeah. you know, it's you. So you mentioned transformation before. So that that it, I think that's the. I forget I forget because I haven't had a chance to say it this year, but it was it was a, a bit of a mantra that I would share with my students when I was teaching the hospitality is that I want to change I want I want to sort of like hang you over this moment of I mean if I, I don't say hang over, I could say I put you at the crossroads or the fork in the road, but I wanna I wanna hold you in a moment between awesome and calamity. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And have you jump. Yeah. And the key is jump, but you have to jump at one of the two. You don't get both at the same time, but you can backtrack, but you have to jump. It's in that moment of taking the chance. And I, I, I observe students and we're talking about, you know, in my cooking class, do I add more salt? Right. <laughs> it's, or a few more tomatoes is the salad balanced, you know, texture, whatever. If they're not, they're not on that you can exist on a surface analysis of it, right? Of course, we can go deeper. And you talked about that, the sort of, you know, that idea that you're making a dish and the dish communicates and it's soaked in the history of a story and a, a customer or someone that you're communicating with, with this, this meal, you're sharing soul by breaking bread. But you can exist in the simplicity too of just taking a chance, add more salt, Yes. Make the dish again. Iterate, iterate, yes. iterate, right? Get a body of work and then decide which version was the tastiest one. Take your notes, take your pictures, right? Capture it. And I always wondered what it was the thing that and it and I don't know if it's it's people, but what's the thing, let's say, no, I guess we'll just go from people. Like what is the thing that doesn't allow us to get out of our way? And I've seen that it's funny. I've seen a similar thing happen with students where they'll take a risk on behalf of their teacher or their, their friend, but not for themselves. And I've seen teachers, educators do the same thing. They'll take a risk on behalf of the student, but not for themselves. What is that? Well, I'm, you know, I mean, that moment of calamity and awe or mm -hmm. um, it does present some risks yeah and part of the risk of course is is that your heart opens I mean and you know I mean that sounds like a reasonable thing except that you know I, I I've, I've come to believe that the construction of our um, stories you know that help to <laughs> that helped us to ground us, to land us in the places that we are. are. Um, we're comfortable with whatever they are. Um, and whether we choose 
the simple or the complex, whether we choose the disastrous or the joyful, we actually have a part of ourselves which is comfortable as long as we have selected the story. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And the moment you take a risk, the moment you say, I'm going to, I'm going to let go of my sense of the outcome of the story. I'm going to allow others to be part of the collaborative creation of whatever is occurring in the moment or whatever happens next. Um, you know, you run the risk of that you have to, that's, that's, that's what you attach to now. And, and we are hard-pressed to give up our stories. We're hard-pressed to give up our, you know... This is what I, I believe to be true. This yeah. Is what I, this is how it's got me through my life so far in this place, um, and I think it's it's why, as teachers, we we need the students, and the students need the teacher. Is that the, the expression, the, the transformative moments, the collaborative moments, the teachable moment, the great learning occurs in in collaboration, that that we have to get to a place where we're pushed to risk ourselves Mm -hmm. and they are answering that because I think what you said there about action action is in fact that you know um, that's that's part of the key ingredient is that you have to do something Mm -hmm. I like the idea that the you know the universe has sort of come to play, and um, but play is is a, a reciprocal. Like yeah. you have to mm-hmm. in, you have to engage in it, and the, and the the joy of play, of course, is is that the rules of of play are negotiable. So, what is true is only true for the moment in which it works. I, I remember listening to my kids. You know, and they were, you know, four and five, my daughters. And um, the one would pick up a, a toy and say, okay, I'm um, a surgeon and I live in a house. And the other one would say, no, you're a sailor and you live on a boat. And she would say, okay, but I'm married and uh, I have a dog. No, you don't have a dog, you have a cat. Okay, I have a cat. And we're on a journey to another <laughs> island. No, not an island. You're going to another world. Yeah, okay. And it's a rocket ship. And what they were doing was they were negotiating the frame that they would then play in. Constantly. Constantly. <laughs> that Constantly. was the game. That was the that game. That became the game. No, well, there would be a moment. There would be a moment when they would go, okay, we have it. There's a structural arrangement that we've agreed to. And then they would play that game mm-hmm. in that until it reached a point where the structure couldn't hold the game anymore. And then they would change the parameters of the game so that they can continue to engage. Because what was important wasn't the rules or the framework. It was the engagement. It was the play. And the not enough naivete to never recognize that the box is one size. Yeah. Because if we go back to the breadcrumbs, the, 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 they're, it's just leading, it's, you're just, you're following at that point. You're just, you're going for it. So it's not even a path that's been, I mean, you listen to your children play enough, you start to realize who's set in the game yeah. tone, right? But yes. really, I've had the same thing happen where I was like, my adult brain wants to know what game they're playing. And my adult brain is not initially capable of just accepting that they're playing. It's a category. It's a type of game. It's a balance of power. It is a, um, an argument. It, it needs to put it into that box. The experience in itself betrays that definition. Yeah. It is. Yes. Flow. You are watching somebody else in flow. Yes. And the moment that you sort of say, hey, take it easy down there. Okay new game and in some ways i've often observed myself and and i'm 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 embarrassed when i think about it that i've broken their flow (laughs) because i've actually taken away the thing that they weren't questioning sorry i've made them question what they're doing when they didn't need to they just needed to keep playing yeah and i'm aware of that as a parent 
And I think I'm also aware of that as an educator, letting that thing play out. I love, I really do love, and it's funny, it's one of those, I tend, for me, I find I tend to take more risk for myself and say yes more for myself than I do for my students. I'm a little bit inverted that way. Yeah. But one of the things that I'm getting, I'm very comfortable myself existing in the ambiguity of change. Just hanging on that one more moment because yes. there's wisdom in there. Like you said, yes. seeking. You're saying you re realize that just by sitting in that moment, one second longer, and I tend to be a little bit competitive, one second longer than everybody else in the group. Yes. <laughs> because I'll take that as the cue that, no, I need, and it could be holding a joke, holding a stare, whatever it is, but just holding that moment, one moment longer, creates just enough I don't know, atmospheric dissonance. There's that energy around you like this is getting weird. But as soon as it gets to that weird moment, you're like, I think I just learned something. I think I just learned something. <laughs> yes. I don't know what it is. And it's funny, I like, I'm really trying to, they're hard to create those moments. But I'm trying to notice myself in those moments so that I'm not pushing through to the obvious answer. And when I'm in conversation with other educators, that is one thing that we like to do. Is get to the answer. We want to get to the answer. Um, which I'm okay with. Yeah. But I think in addition to being okay with wanting to action and get to an answer, finish the lesson, get to the, like all that stuff that is a part of school. I really like the moments where I can find that sitting in the ambiguity because I've really come to believe that you get something from that. You get a new tool. You notice something that, because it's sometimes in that ambiguity that things get really quiet. No matter how loud the moment is, it gets real quiet. And something just kind of ping. And you notice and you're like, that's what I was waiting for. I didn't know. It's a bit of an addiction. Yeah. Yeah, I, like, I like sort of like pu pushing myself just to kind of hit the neutral and listen for a little bit longer. Uh, when they talk about the art of teaching, that, I think that, that waiting on it is the art. Mm -hmm. Right? Of knowing I'm gonna be patient I'm gonna sit I'm gonna attend to the moment and if the moment doesn't present itself it's like your kids you know playing you know from upstairs if there's a moment in the game when the game has gone bad and you need to go downstairs and someone's go, crying you need to stop <laughs> yeah someone's crying yeah someone's yeah. in a headlock <laughs> yeah yeah it's totally true um, I, I think we we make this mistake all the time, and I think it's called logical typing, but I think in, um, in education, we often, we often um, get the kids to make a menu and then eat it, um, mistaking the menu for food, right? We, we, we think the map is the territory, and it's not, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the curriculum is the vehicle by which you get to the thing that you're doing. But the, you know, the menu is the picture of the food. The food itself is the, the consumption and the flavor and the smell and the taste and the moment and the experience and the relationship and all those other things. It's, it's, it's that, which is what we're actually trying to get them to. We're actually trying to get them to that, to those moments, mm -hmm. you know? You, we need to teach our kids to tie their shoes. Good life That's a skill. practical skill. Yeah. But more importantly is how we teach them to tie their shoes. Like, how did we sit with them? How did we talk to them? What was the story? You know, did we use the rabbit story song that our mothers or grandmothers or mm -hmm. grandfathers taught us? And did we then share with them um, uh, that story? Like at that moment, so that what what occurred in the um, what occurred in the uh, teaching about the shoes wasn't this is how you tie your shoes, mm -hmm. which is an important lesson. It was this is how you and I and your grandparents are in relationship. Yep, and these are the threads that bind us. Yep, and so that even if they don't know. And, I, and I, I, I believe this to be true. I've seen it pan out, you know, from teaching film studies. Yep. I'll often only get through 30 seconds of a film. And, I'll, and we'll talk for 76 minutes about the 30 seconds of the film. Because there's so many layers of the subconscious 
going on in the first 30 seconds of the film that we, we don't get to the, the, other, the rest of the film because 90% of what's going on in our brain, of our experience, is subconscious. It's happening at that level. But you hit the lesson. You hit the lesson. See, that's what I'm getting in your message here is that you could do the 70 minutes with a five-minute conversation. Yes. You know, and... Okay, you got that? You got... We're good? We're good? Glad we spent 70 minutes watching a movie. Yes. As opposed to five minutes getting what we need and then noticing everything else. Yes. I hear you. I hear you. Yep. I think that's some, I think that's that's a thing in education. That's it's a good thing to work on. Yeah. Well, 30, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Well, let's do it the other way. If we have 75 minutes to play with. Five directed. 70. Let's see where we can go with this. I think that that's a real thing for me. That's a real thing for me. Getting out of my own way and getting out of the way of the students. When I was uh, like, I don't know, maybe even fourth year of teaching, whatever, I got a grade 12 general English class. And um, I had to teach poetry. And um, the kids didn't want to do poetry. They hated poetry. You know, they were adverse to it. It was, they didn't understand it and they didn't like it. And so I didn't really have anything, but I, I did this directed, um, mindful, you know, you know, I didn't tell them it was poetry. I just said, I'm going to say some stuff and I want you to write down, <laughs> right, whatever you are seeing. Yep. And so it was all visualization exercise. And um, I walked them through this little journey, mind journey. And at the end of it, um, I gathered them all up and I didn't read any names and I just read them back to the class. And after about the fourth one, I was crying. Mm. And the kids were like, we didn't write those. That, that, that wasn't our class. And I'm like, is this good poetry? And they were like, yes. And I said, is this amazing poetry? Yes. Is this moving you? Yes. You wrote this. And, and I was moved because they were saying things that were way beyond their wisdom. Um, if you tested them, you know, if you said, consciously tell me what it is that you understand about metaphor yeah. or symbol. The curriculum. The curriculum. Yeah. And they were using alliteration and they were using metaphor and they were using symbol and they were using pacing and they were using rhythm and they were creating visual spaces that if I'd actually tried to teach them poetry, I probably would have knocked that out of them. And it was a profound moment to realize that these kids in front of me were quite brilliant. Mm -hmm. But they were really brilliant at, at that. Like, because they're, because they're naturally brilliant. Because we naturally understand the world at an unconscious level really profoundly. We, we understand how somebody's walking. How somebody walks into a room. Mm -hmm. The tone of their voice how they stand, how they move. It, it's, it's why when you have a moment in your class and your heart is filled with passion and you really care about the moment and you start to say something, people start listening. Because at a very profound level, they hear that you're speaking to that place in them. That's, mm -hmm that's already wide awake and open and that just wants to have a decent conversation with the conscious mind that keeps getting put to sleep by <laughs> emotion as the emotion as the assessment tool. Yes. That's yeah. good. I think that's enough. Yeah. That's great. I think <laughs> and part I part I, I I I'm reserving I'm not I am not, uh, I think I need to, I need to think, I need to have some reflection time on this, man. As always, we've never actually had this much time. I know. Direct, even when I was able to come and participate at the sweat lodge, it was very, um, 
I, 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 cho- I, I intentionally came with, with openness and I just, I wanted to take in what I was being given. I didn't want to, I didn't want to take, I just wanted to sort of receive what I was being given. So in doing so, if, if the version that you remember me being there was a little less active or gregarious, I think it was because I was so hyper aware of like trying to maintain sponge. Yeah. Cause I actually thought I, I knew as I was driving over to your, your house that this was a moment in time. This is something I needed to notice without having the words. I think, I don't know if I had the words in my brain that poetry wasn't there for me to sort of recognize it, but I knew that this was something special that, um, in order for me to be open to it, I had to, I had to check a little bit of me and in doing so kind of shelf it to make space for something else. Yeah. Um, but I know coming away from that, there was some pretty profound, bad word. There was learning that came out of that, that I can remember sharing with my father and him being a a businessman first, but an aspiring artist and writer. And I can remember it created some really interesting conversation between him and I, because at the time he was struggling with health things that he didn't have the openness to share. And by me sort of speaking about this kind of strange process I had about his, you know, taking in the teaching that I was receiving there, I think it allowed him to exist, at least in my, sp- I made enough space for him to talk. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Like it's, it's almost as if I need, I need not to find some space to do the thinking about what we took in. Good. I'll leave you with one last thing because this is a nice elder thing. I want it. Um, So asking the elder about insurance, I went to the elder and said, look, I'm having all these people over. This is the first time I ever had a sweat lodge on the property. And I said, "Um, you know, I'm kind of worried. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's an activity. People's health is at risk. Should I get insurance? A waiver. Yeah, should I get some permission insurance, form. a permission form, something to protect myself? <laughs> I want this on file. You know, from this, it's this sacred ceremony. It's a you know, universal ceremony. Mm-hmm. But you know, and so he looks at me and he says, uh, "Andy, um, you should have faith. You know, you know, say your prayers, be in a good way. Um, you know." do all the things that you need to do to prepare the ceremony in a good way and uh, get insurance. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, you know, it's like, that's the classroom. Like you bring, your, bring your curriculum, it is. bring your lesson plan. Yeah. But also be prepared for it to, to not be necessary. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So I, I, I like to ask at the end, um, do you want to be found somewhere? Do I want to be, at the, do you want it, to be found? Do you the, want to be found? Sometimes some people mention the, the oh, Twitter yes, handle. Yes. They mention. Continue they, the conversations. Is if you are open to people seeking you, they will. Yes. And yeah. it goes, as you said, there's, there's a dialogue there. If you are open, then someone, whether they reach out via Twitter or they recognize your voice in a room or they see your name on an email list and realize that the two of you are going to arrive at the same place at a conference, that is, that's all the sort of permission, I guess, that I'm asking you right now. Yeah. And if there's somewhere specific you'd like them to find you, it's up to you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I can give you my uh, email and all that kind of stuff, so yeah, happy to do it. I think, I think that is also part of the deal, like a... a of choosing that you are going to allow yourself to surrender to that space between chaos and I think clarity. I have I have your email. I can include it in the notes if that's yeah if absolutely that's open to. okay. Then I'll just I'll include it in the in the podcast notes. Yeah, I I I, I may pass people on to somebody else because that's sort of tends to be the way it works. Is it does the conversation that they really want to have is with somebody I might know. I've never thought for a moment that me in the class that I am the that I'm the gate or yeah. the gatekeeper. I'm, I, I'm okay with being that sort of like that signpost yeah. and a signpost will, can give you a street name, Yes. but you could be looking for something else and you just need that street name to move on. I am completely comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. The discovery that maybe this isn't the place. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. I can't thank you enough. Uh, 
um, you know, I, to your um, listeners, you know, they hopefully out of all of this, they they start to hear you. Mm. You know, because the people that know you love you, mm-hmm. and um, what they love about you is um, uh, what I, you know, what I'm pursuing. Mm-hmm. Right, that you're another person that um, has fallen in love with life, mm-hmm. and uh, that just permeates everything then that you do and how you do it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for noticing. Thanks for <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being around. <laughs> awesome. Take care. Okay.